Hello, my name is Brian. I'm an alcoholic. And I want to thank you. I've spoken at a few conferences, and, and each one has its own distinct personality. And the one that shows up most, not this one, is fun. You're fun people. And I've been having a fun time. And I want to thank each and every one of you for having me here, and especially Stan and Marion, a couple of them that I'm learning to love. I've had the honor of, ha of having Thanksgiving dinner with them in New York. And to be here with Glenn and Jane, I mean, it, it's just, uh, it's like fantasy time. I, on Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the morning, I was getting on the plane at Kennedy, Airp at Kennedy Airport, and it was snowing and sleeting and rainy and cold, and here I am now sitting out there and they're alone and all dancing and drumming, and uh, hey, it's like a fantasy. It's really like a fantasy, you know. I don't want to thank each and every one of you. My name is Brian. I'm an alcoholic. I come from New York. <clears throat> and I don't remember the first time I picked up a drink, but I do remember the first time I'd gotten drunk. It was at a block party. Thrown for the returning soldiers, sailors, marines, the wax, the waves, the bands, all the Second World War veterans. And it was thrown at 98th Street between Lexington and Park Avenue. And it was one of the, uh, one of the first block parties thrown for the returning soldiers and the vets from the Second World War. And it was a big one. And all the hoi ploy of New York was there. All the big mucky mucks. They were all there. Mayor LaGuardia and Beto, all the congressmen and, and Bill O'Dwyer, the, uh, the police commission and all the godfathers, I mean, anybody, they were all there sucking up to the microphone. I mean, anybody, and they had stars and, and, and flags hanging from the fire escapes, and they had tables laden with food, food that you hadn't seen since the beginning of the war, and, and every ten feet you had huge kegs of beer donated by uh, Knickerbocker Brewery. And I was sitting on a stoop with a friend of mine, Johnny, and we were sitting there with this war hero. He had all sorts of braids, and he was sitting up there, and he had a mug of beer in his hand and a cigarette. And he took a puff of the cigarette, he inhaled the smoke, and he said, I went to China, I had a hot cup of coffee, with that he drank the mug of beer, and he said, and I brought the smoke back here, and he blew the smoke out. Now, drinking a beer didn't impress Johnny and I, but what impressed us was the way he made the smoke disappear. I mean, he'd take this big puff, one minute the smoke would be there, boom, it'd be gone. He'd go to China, have a hot cup of coffee, drink that mug of beer, and he'd bring the smoke back, and out of nowhere, he'd blow the smoke out. So, with the free beer and the free cigarettes, Johnny and I were puffing away at the cigarettes, going to China, having a hot cup of coffee, coming back. And the end result was I was smoking like a professional, I was drunk as hell. I remember falling off the stoop and Johnny falling off on top of me. I'm trying to get up and the streets are going up and down. I'm bumping into all this, uh, and, and knocking over the kegs of beer and, and, and everybody's smacking me off the top of the head and I'm throwing up. And it was the first time I can recall getting drunk and I remember it with great fondness. And there were many such parties and I remember I get out of school at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I get the shoe shine box. And I go along 2nd Avenue, 3rd Avenue, Lexington Avenue, shining all these shoes. And I come home, and these young soldiers and sailors and marines and merchant seamen, they'd be sitting on this here neighborhood stoop. And this was like the hoi polloi of the drinking society, the stoop. And whoever was just being discharged from the service, or whoever was going away to prison, or whoever was becoming a priest, or whoever just became a cop, they would sit on the top step of the stoop, and they'd pass around these cardboard containers, containers of beer, and they would tell stories of death and travel and destruction and fighting jails and whorehouses, and I'd sit there in the shoeshine box looking up at them. These were my heroes. These were the big guys. These were the guys that went out and they did it. I mean, they just didn't talk about it. They would show me the proof. They'd go into the, into the building and they'd bring out the German helmet with the bullet hole right through the center of it, or the broken bonsai sword, or the blood-splattered Japanese flag, or the German cigarettes, the Italian money. These were my heroes. And uh, I got a little bit bigger, and I stopped moving into the big league. I started selling papers in the saloons now. And I get home a little later at night, and these young soldiers and sailors and marines and merchant seamen, they were no longer uh, sitting on the stoops. Now they were drinking down in the ballpark, the empty buildings along the, the East River. Uh, I come from a work ethnic background, and the only requirement for becoming a man was a desire to work. As long as you had a desire to work, you could beat your wife, beat the kids, beat the system. You could beat anything you want, as long as you had a desire to work. And these young soldiers and sailors and marines and merchant seamen, they no longer worked. They were winos. 
And they were ostracized out of the neighborhood. But they were my heroes and I loved them. And I'd search them out late at night and they'd be passing around this wine bottle, Muscatel, and they'd be telling stories of death and traveling and destruction and fighting jails and whorehouses. And I'd kick in the money and a bottle would come to me and I'd start sucking on a bottle. And they wouldn't say anything because I was paying my own way. And I was about 13 years old. And Johnny and I, this friend of mine, we had some money in our papers from hustling papers in the saloons the night before. And we went into this back into this vacant building. There was a whole camp of winos laying there. And I remember shaking this one guy. He gave him the high sign to come on out. And he came out, and I gave him enough money to go get his three bottles of Sneaky Pete, a bottle for me, Johnny, and a bottle for himself. And I remember this man is one of the most handsomest men I could remember. He stood about six foot two. He had jet black curly hair, big blue eyes. The most he could have been was anywhere from about 28 to 33 years old. And here he was, an old, old, young, dirty man, a wino. Now, I remember three years prior to that at that block party, the mayor was trying to get next to him and everybody was trying to get next to him to have their photographs taken because he had been a war hero in the Pacific. Tokyo Rose had mentioned his name on the program a couple of times that they had scouts out trying to kill this guy, that he was causing all this trouble. And here he was, an old, young, dirty man doing the bidding of two 13-year-olds. And he went and he got the wine and he come back and he got his bottle and he shuffled into the, in, into the building. And Johnny and I went behind the building, and I cracked my pint, and Johnny cracked his. We started drinking, and we started laughing and giggling, and arm, arm wrestling, and body punching, and shadow punching. We knocked off the two pints. I remember walking up the street to get to the building to go in and get the window to go get his three more pints. And I remember walking up, and I'm pushing the people away from me, and I'm elbowing. And I was about this big, and it was the first experience with beer muscles. Here I am, pushing everybody aside. And I went in and got him, and he went and got the three more pints. And I remember putting that second pint. I remember it as vividly as I'm looking at this mic. I remember putting that second pint to my mouth. And the next thing I knew, I come out of a blackout. My mother had my head over the tubs. I was throwing up all this wine into the tubs. My two brothers are leaning over, punching the hell at me, screaming at me, where the hell I had been all day. The neighbors had come in and told my mother that Brian was drunk, the son was drunk, staggering all over the neighborhood, and my mother was out in the family and the, the neighbors, and everybody scoured the neighborhood, and they didn't find me until about 11 o'clock at night. And I just couldn't tell them what had happened. I mean, one minute it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I hear it was 11 o'clock at night. Now, this wasn't the first time I had gotten drunk. I've been drunk at these block parties many times. But this was the first time I pulled a blank. This was the first time something else happened. I was 13 when this happened, and it bothered me. And a couple of days later, I'm walking up, one of these big guys come down, I know him from hustling papers in the saloon, and I stopped him, and I started to explain what had happened. And I remember looking up at that guy, and the guy was looking down at me, the hair was hanging in his eyes, he had a big smile on his face, hands on his hips, he's rocking back, looking at me. And when I finished, he turned around, and he said, kid, were you drinking? And I said, yeah, I was drinking. He said, were you drunk? I said, yeah, I was drunk. And he just leaned back and smiled and shrugged. He didn't say anything, he just shrugged. Tossed my hair, walked around me, kept walking. It seems like I'd been born and raised with what I would call this alcoholic shrug. I've seen it all my life. I'd walk into a bar, and it wouldn't be a soul in the bar. I'd say, where the hell is everybody? I'd say, out of our looking for Joe's car. He doesn't know where he parked it last night. They'd be going up and down looking for his car. And somebody would say, was Joe drinking last night? And they'd say, yeah. They'd say, was Joe drunk last night? And they'd say, yeah. And they just shrugged. They went about their business. They never said anything. I'd walk into the bar. They'd say, Mary is on the phone. She's hysterical. She's going crazy. She doesn't know where she left the kids. And somebody says, is Mary drinking? They say, yeah. They say, Mary drunk? They say, yeah. And they just shrugged. It was just like a, a, a blanket endorsement. I swear to God, they never said anything. They just shrugged. Now, when I was 14, all the action took place in the pool room. That's where the big guys hung out. And in order to get in there, you had to be 16. So I broke, it, I broke into the church rectory. I robbed a pad of uh, baptismal papers along with the church seal. I forged my papers, making myself 16. I sold off the rest. When you're 16, you had to be 18 to get your Siemens papers without your parents' consent. So with my phony papers, I got my Siemens papers. And at 17, I ran away and I went to sea. And no matter where I went, this shrug followed me. It, it was like some sort of international voodoo. I mean, I remember Singapore, my first trip. I was in a nightclub in, uh, in Singapore and I got into a fight. And I got pretty bad cut up and pretty bad beat up. And the gendarmes came and they took me to the hospital where they had me stitched up. And then they took me and they threw me in a hole. And I'd been in the hole for three days. And, they and I remember when they called me out. In those days, Singapore was still a British crown colony. And when they took me out and they put me in the docket, I looked like one of these punk rockers or one of these wrestlers. 
Half of the head was shaved like a mohawk and all stitched up, and the rest of the hair was pointed in all different colors. My face was all black and blue, and the stitches were stuck to the shirt. And they put me in the docket. And, and up, sitting up there was the British magistrate. He had a big white curly wig on, a long black flowing robe. And representing me was the American consulate. I'm standing there in the docket, and the magistrate leaned over and he said to the American consulate, he says, was the bloke drinking? And he leaned over to me, and he said, were you drinking? And I leaned over him, and I looked at the American consulate, eyeball to eyeball, one American to another. And I said, was I drinking? I said, of course I was drinking. You don't think I look like this sober, do you? I said, what the hell kind of an American do you think I am anyway? I said, of course I was drinking. I was drinking. They were drinking. We're all drinking. And he looked up and he said, yes, your magistrate, the bloke was drinking. And the judge went like this here. <laughs> the American consul went like that. The captain went like that. I went like that. And ladies and gentlemen, that's my story in a nutshell. It was just one shrug after another. That's where alcohol took me, ladies and gentlemen. Alcohol reduced me and my life to a human shrug. They say the ship sailed for Panama last night. Was Brian aboard? I don't know. The ship came back from Panama. Was Brian aboard? Did Brian go home last night? Is Brian coming out today? Does Brian have any money left? Whatever happened to that nice girl Brian was going with? Where the hell is Brian? And that's about it. About 1969, I was on a real wicked drunk, and I come out of a blackout, and I had a phone in my hand, and I'm weaving back and forth, and I'm listening to this voice on the phone. And the guy is saying, take it easy, Brian, take it easy. Give us your address, and we'll send a couple of men over to talk to you. And I couldn't quite figure out who this guy was and wanted to send a couple of men over to talk to me. So I kept throwing out a couple of words, thinking maybe he'd bite, and I could fill in around his sentence and figure out who he is. And he kept saying, take it easy, Brian, give us your address. We'll send a couple of men over to talk to you. I said, wait a minute. What do you mean, who are you anyway? I said, what do you mean, who, who the hell are you? He says, I'm so-and-so from Intergroup. Now, if you never heard the word Intergroup before, you have to admit, it sounds like some kind of communist word, you know? <laughs> I said, Intergroup? I said, what the hell are you talking about? I said, who the hell are you? He says, I'm so-and-so from Intergroup, Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, Intergroup, Alcoholics Anonymous? I said, how the hell did you get my number? He said, you just called us up. I said, I call you up. What the hell would I call you up for? He said, take it easy, Brian. Take it easy. Give it your address. I said, you hold it right there, buster. Don't you be sending anybody around here starting trouble. You want something, I'll give you a punch in the puss. That's what I'll give you. And I hung up the phone. I sat in the bed and the sweat started pouring off me. My mind kept racing back and forth in retrospect trying to figure out what in God's name did I do this time that intergroup would be after me. I mean, the only thing I knew about Intergroup was the old Second World War movies, you know, with Humphrey Bogart and, Al and Alan Ladd. And in those movies, when an Intergroup was after you, it meant one thing, you know. <laughs> so I got up and I put the light out and I sat there and I got up and I looked out the keyhole thinking maybe I'd see somebody out in the hall. And I get up and I, cross, I, I crept across the floor and I leaned up against the wind and I pulled out the shade and I looked across the thinking maybe I'd see an Intergroup guy over there, you know, looking up. <laughs> hey, what the hell did I know? By 1970, I was on another drunk and a mean drunk. And I come out of a blackout again. I'm talking to this voice on the phone again. And he told me where the meeting was. And the meeting was at Butterfield, the Butterfield Group in 72nd Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. And I went to the meeting, and the only thing I heard at the meeting was stay out of one bar, one bar at a time. Now, I'm sure my rummy head, what the man was saying, was stay, stay away from one drink, one drink at a time. But I heard stay out of one bar, one bar at a time. And I walked out, I walked up to 72nd Street and 3rd Avenue, and I walked from 72nd Street and 3rd Avenue to 93rd Street and 3rd Avenue, straight ahead, and believe me, there were bars to the right and bars to the left, and I kept going straight ahead. I got to a bar that I, uh, that I drank in, I walked into the bar, I ordered up my usual sobering up drink, which was a large club soda with a big twist of lemon. I'm standing at the bar, and next thing my body started to shake, and I could feel my head winding up, my legs, and I went into a fit. And when I come out of the fit, I was in an ambulance with this friend of mine, Jackie, and his big attendant was kneeling on top of me, and he's ramming something in my mouth, and I hear the sirens, and I couldn't figure out what in God's name was going on. I grabbed the guy, I rolled him over, I got on top of him, I started pounding the shit out of him, 
He started screaming to stop the ambulance, stop the ambulance. The ambulance came to a screeching halt. The guy come running around. He opened the door. He stuck his head in to see what was going on. I run over. I gave him a kick in a mug. I jumped down. I took off like a shot. Jackie ran over. He gave him a kick in a push. He jumped down. He ran up. I'm running down this block. Jackie's chasing me. I ran up this block. Jackie's chasing me. I spotted a bar. I go running in the bar. I'm huffing and puffing in the bar. Jackie comes running in. He's huffing and puffing. I grab him. I said, what the hell happened? God damn it, man. What happened? What, what happened, Jackie? He says, I don't know. He says, you come in the bar, you're all right, and you went into some kind of fit. Now, the only thing I could attribute the fit to was this, this intergroup anonymous, you know? I mean, they told me to stay out of one bar, one bar at a time. I passed all these bars, nothing happened to me. I went in one goddamn bar, and I woke up in an ambulance. I remember saying to Jackie, no wonder these people are anonymous. I mean, they could kill you in broad daylight and never leave a fingerprint. I said, I said with this intergroup anonymous, Jack, I said, you know I tried, man. I, I, they had one crack at me. They goddamn near killed me. I said, that's it, Jackie. About 1969, I was on a ship. I was on a drunk. We were about, four, about three or four days out of the Suez Canal. And I had booze stashed all over the ship. I was on this head drunk. And the word came down that we're coming up against a storm. They're batting down a hatch dog down the, the portholes. And somehow I thought in my head that the storm was there for me. It was looking for me. And I remember when the storm hit, it was going up and down. I said, do you want me? Okay. I got the bottle. I threw the door open. I went out in the deck. And the waves are coming. I'm laughing and throwing punches at it and peeing and kicking and spitting at it and dancing. And it's slamming me all over the place. And the end result was it broke my shoulder. They wanted to take me off in Alexandria, but in another week or so, we'd be in Naples. And I figured, nah, I'll ride it out and go to Naples. And they took me off in Naples. They had me there for three days. And then they, they put me in a big body cast, and I had a big bar, and my arm was out like this. And I hadn't drank now, maybe maybe about two weeks. And the, the agent came, and he took me. We got on the train, and we went out to Rome, to the airport. And we got there, and we had about a two-hour layover. And uh, I said to the guy, to the agent, I said, Are you married? He said, yeah. I said, you got kids? He said, yeah. I said, look, the plane is right here. I can't miss it. Why don't you go home and spend some time with the wife and kids? I said, I'll just get a few postcards. And uh, write the boys in the bar, let them know what's going on. The guy said, all right. So I got some postcards. I'm sitting at the bar, and I'm having a cappuccino. And I, I told the guy, yeah, yeah, I throw a little Fundador, a little brandy in there. Throw, you know. So the next time I'm drinking there, I'm on the plane. I'm drunk as hell on the plane. By the time that gangway came down in New York, I come off that plane like a drunken runaway construction boom. I'm banging into people going in there. I fell on the escalator. The bar jammed it. I mean, the, the sparks were coming out. People were falling all over me. About 1970, we're about five days out of Seattle, bound for Japan. I'm on a drunk again. I booze stashed all over the ship. The word came down and the storm was coming up. I said, God damn, that storm is still there, still looking for me. And I said, well, you want me, you got me. And the storm came, and I got out on deck, and I started peeing and laughing and singing and dancing and drinking, and it's slamming me all over the place. And a wave came, picked me up, slammed me up against the housing, and shattered the lower part of my back. Said so it had me belly down until we got to Japan. They took me off. They had me in the hospital for 16 days where they operated on me. And the agent came and he picked me up and he took me out to Tokyo. Now, I hadn't drank now maybe three weeks, maybe a month. I forget. And uh, there was about a two-hour layover. I said to the guy, you married? He said, yeah. I said, you got kids? He said, yeah. I said, look, man, I'm a grown man. The plane is right there. I can't miss it. I said, yeah, go home and spend some time with the kids. And then I got some postcards. I'm sitting there at the bar. I'm writing it out, and I'm looking at the kettle there, and I tell the guy, hey, uh, heat up some sake. Come on, heat up a little sake there. Not too hot. I'm drinking a sake. I'm drunk as hell on the plane. I passed out. When I got up, there was a big puddle of blood all over the seat that I was in. The drain had come out, and they had me in the back, but they took down my pants and they're wiping the blood off me, and I had to borrow one of those old-fashioned Kotex and pack me with the Kotex. And when the plane got to Alaska, the Anchorage, they had to get my luggage out to give me a new set of clothes. I was a mess. By the time I got to New York, I'm home there a couple of days, I figured, Jesus Christ, the hell with this going to see stuff? I mean, it seems like every time I go out there now, there's a whole school of angry Moby Dicks waiting for me. I mean, I didn't mind going to see, but I didn't want to die over it. So I came back and I went to work in the tunnels. I'm a retired sand hog. And for those of you who don't know what a sand hog is, where the miners in New York, where the compressed air workers, where the ones that work in underneath the river and put the caissons in. I went back to work. And in about 19, uh, 1970, about, 19, no, about 1971, I was on a real bad drunk, a real wicked drunk. And it was banging and banging at the door, banging at the door. And 
And I hear, open up, Brian, open up. He said, open up the door, kick it in, God damn it, open up. It was the union delegate. I got up and I opened the door and he, I said, keep your voice down. Jesus, you're letting the whole neighborhood know what's, what the hell are you doing? He come in. He said, man, this place stinks. What the hell are you doing? He went over. He opened the window, pulled up in the shade. He said, man, what the hell are you doing? There was booze on me. I was on a drunk. He said, what the hell are you doing, Brian? I said, Jesus, keep your voice down. I said, what, the, what are you making a big stink about? He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm having a couple of drinks. He said, how long do you think you've been having this couple of drinks? And I said, oh, you know. I said, I don't know. I mean, you have a couple of days or something. He said, you've been on this drunk six weeks, Brian. He said, I can't keep covering your job. When the hell are you coming back to work? I was the dynamite around the job. And I said, I said, uh... What's today? He said, today's Wednesday. I said, all right, look, I'll be back to work uh, Monday. He said, Brian, please, can I tell him you're coming back to work? I said, look, you can take book on it. I said, I'll be back Monday. And all I ever needed all my life, all around the world, to come off a drunk, usually I could bail out in about three days. All I needed was a floor, toilet, and water. And I go through the whips and the, and the runs and the, and the willies, and I mean, I go through the shakes, the horrors, and usually I could bail out in about three days. And I did. And I went back to work at 7 o'clock, Monday morning, 9 o'clock, they called for the dynamite. I, I loaded up the dynamite, went down 850 feet down to a tunnel level. We went through the compression chamber. And once you get to the other side of the compression chamber, once the dynamite enters the tunnel, all the lights and all the electricity are shut off. And they load with flashlights and headlights and air lights, and it's eerie. And we went up and they started loading the dynamite, and I went into a fit. And they turned around and said, what the hell is going on? He said, it's Brian, where is he? He's over there. No, no, he's over there. Watch out, you're standing on him. And I'm flopping, I'm pulling out the dynamite. I'm all flopping around. And they called out and they called for, the, uh, for an ambulance and they heard that it was dynamite. And at that time, there was a lot of dynamite being stolen off the construction jobs. There was a lot of bombing going on in New York. And the, they called the bomb squad. The bomb squad called the mayor. I mean, and by the time I got out, they were taking me up. They had binoculars on me, baseball, bats. On flag jackets, the mayor's looking at that they're, they're protecting the mayor. I come up, they thought they had this mad bomber. I come out, I had peed my pants, I'm shaking, I'm white as hell. The mayor starts blowing and stop that. They're wasting his time with this drunken fool. And, were, and I was in a lot of trouble. They claimed I was an epileptic, that I had an epileptic fit. And if you're an epileptic, they won't allow you to work in the tunnels for fear that maybe I could have set the charge off. Or if I'm running a motor, maybe a runaway motor, or kick a scaffold out. So they wouldn't let me go back to work until I went to Lenox Hill Hospital for a whole series of uh, epilepsy tests, which I did. And uh, after I had all the tests, a couple of days later, I'm sitting outside the neurosurgeon's office. He stuck his head out. He said, Mr. Mines, I said, here, he gave me the high sign. As I walked into his office, right before I walked in, I stopped, and I took a big, deep breath, and I walked in. And he's sitting there, and he got the charts and the, the, the graphs and everything is there. He said, well, everything here looks pretty negative. And I heard the word negative, and I let my breath out just a little bit. I said, w what do you mean negative? He said, well, uh, things, here, things here look pretty good. I let my breath out just a little bit more. I said, you mean to say I'm not an epileptic? He said, no, nah, you're not an epileptic. You're an alcoholic. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, I'm not an epileptic, though, right? He said, no, you're an alcoholic. I said, then I didn't have an... Uh, a, a, an epileptic fit in the tunnel, right? He said, no, you had an alcoholic seizure. I said, oh, thank God. I leaned over, I grabbed him, I started hugging him. I mean, I couldn't care less about being an alcoholic. What the hell do I care about being an alcoholic? As far as I was concerned, any man worked the salt was an alcoholic. You see, the key was, I wasn't an epileptic. They're the goddamn people that get you fired. <laughs> so I had him put it in writing and went back. I saw the safety the engineer. I threw it on his desk. I said, here. I'm an alky, not an epi. Here it is. Alcoholic, right here. He read it. He said, oh, so you're an alcoholic. Huh? Brian said, yeah. He said, so am I. I said, no kidding. He said, you're going back to work? I said, yeah. He said, you want a drink? I said, sure. He closed the door. He pulled out the bottle. He started sucking on the bottle. They called for the dynamite. I got on the cage, going down the tunnel level, and life was good. I mean, here I had my job back. It was secure. They couldn't fire me. I was only an alcoholic. I mean, I just found a newfound friend that had a bottle tucked away. I mean, you really couldn't beat it. And uh, there was a friend of mine, Joe. Joe and I were born and raised together, went to sea together, and now we're working the tunnels together. He had been sober in AA for seven years. And he heard about the trouble I was in. And he came up to the house and he said, Look, Brian, why don't you try to come to a couple of AA meetings with me? Now, he had been 12-stepping me all along since he had come into AA. And I agreed to go. And the only reason I agreed to go is because I just couldn't seem to get a, whole, uh, uh, a handle on these convulsions. 
I was convulsing in the street and subway platforms. Now I was on a job and I was getting in trouble. And I agreed to go. And at the second meeting, I heard the speaker guarantee that if you don't pick up the first drink, you can't get drunk. He guaranteed that it's impossible to get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink. And afterward, a couple of blocks away, Joe and I went into a restaurant for coffee. And all the AA people come in and start filling up the restaurant. I leaned over to him and I said, Joe, how long have you been in AA, Joe? Joe said, seven years. I said, Joe, just between you and I, we're buddies since we're children. I said, did you understand that guy back there when he guaranteed it's impossible to get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink? Did you understand him, Joe? Joe says, yeah, sure, I understood him. I said, Joe, please, please. Deep down in the caverns of your bowels, Joe, did you really understand what the man said? That it's impossible to get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink. Joe says, yeah, I understand. What are you trying to say? I said, what I'm trying to say, Joe, is, well, you're being bullshitted. You're throwing good money in the basket full of happy horse shit. Of course you can't get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink. Joe, that's like me guaranteeing you that you won't get run over by a train if you don't leave the house. It's all happy horse shit, Joe. What's wrong with you? He said, look, please, Brian, please, take the meeting book. Try 90 days, 90 meetings. I said, Joe, I pushed it back. I said, Joe, Joe, please. Maybe you don't mind sitting there, Joe, humped over in the front row, squinting up at the speaker, slurping your lips for sobriety like you're some kind of AA Quasimodo. I said, Joe, that is in my eye. Whatever happened to your dignity, Joe? Whatever happened to your pride? He pushed the meeting book back, and I pushed it back, and I said, Joe, I'm your buddy. Mark my words, Joe. You keep hanging around with those people, and you're going to be here for another seven years. I'm telling you, Joe. <laughs> Just then the bell will start ringing from the church. And I broke out laughing. I said, Joe, you better get back there. Somebody got your job. <laughs> that was in the early fall of 71. And I went to all the holidays. I went to all the holidays. Never picked up a drink. Was wheeling and dealing with the women in the bar. Everything was still going. You know, making big money. And I live in 86th Street between 2nd and 1st Avenue. And that's where the St. Patrick's Day play breaks up. That's where I'm born and raised. I know everybody. And everybody from all over New York and the state and that, they all come in. And we have a big reunion there. And my nieces came in. And I remember walking up. My niece had one arm and my niece had the other arm. And I had a camel hair coat with a big green tie and a Russian, a Russian Cossack hat on with sprigs of shamrocks. And I'm walking up and everybody's waving to me and they slap me on the back and taking photographs. And I hadn't drank now, you know, since the fall, maybe four months. And I got up and they're passing a bottle around and the bottle came to me and I pulled the plug and I took a swig. And this time I was in the grip of the grape for two weeks. For two weeks the, the fears were so great that I never left the apartment. I had the doors locked, the windows locked, the shades drawn, the phone off the hook. The only phone call I made was to the liquor store across the street in the morning. I had the booze delivered. And only an alcoholic would understand I loved it. I was totally isolated for two weeks. I loved it. The only friends and enemies I had was the furniture. I would stand in the middle of the room with my head up, my shoulders squared away, the wind gently tossing my hair, my eyes squinting with mirth, searching out the horizon for today's challenge, my nostrils flaring with excitement, my teeth bared with lust, my chest slowly heaving, my hands opening and closing slowly with anticipation. I would stand there truly a man amongst men. All things to women. Jackie and Nassas would be kneeling on the ground with her arms around my knees saying, I love you, Brian, I love you. Please take the money, take the money. And I'd throw my head back and laugh and say, Money, you can't buy a man like me with money. And I'd pick her up and I'd open the door and I'd throw her out. Next minute to be banging at the door. I'd open it up and be Sophia Lauren. I heard about you, Brian. Please, just once, just once. And I'd throw her out and I'd slam the door and I'd yell through the door, Why don't you goddamn women leave me alone? Can't you see I'm only human? Leave me alone, God damn it. I'd be standing in the middle of the room huffing and puffing, huffing and puffing because I had just knocked out Muhammad Ali for the heavyweight championship of the world. And I would always knock, I would always knock him out March 16th so they would beg me to lead the St. Patrick's Day parade. And I could see myself leading the parade, making that wide turn on 86th Street and 5th Avenue. And the major domo would be standing there with the stick in his hand. And the bagpipes, they'd all be waiting until Brian was in place. And all of a sudden, the, the major domo would bring down the stick. And all of a sudden, the pipes and the flutes and the fiddles and the screaming and the yelling. And the cops would be on the horses, skittering all over the place. And the cops would be on the ground, trying with their arms locked, trying to hold back the...
I'd be standing in the middle of the room holding a bottle up, holding a bottle of booze. I'd be standing in the middle of the room weaving back and forth. The hair would be wild and matted from however long I was on it, drunk, and the drunk, and the beard and this vomity, dribbly T-shirt, and the tears would be, tears would be pouring down my eyes, big bubbles of snot would be in my nose, and, and barely hanging off my hips would be these warm, wrinkled, farty pair of shorts, and I'd, I'd be weaving back and forth accepting the applause because it was the third year in a row I had won the Academy Award. <laughs> well, anyway, April Fool's Day, 1972, Intergroup finally came and got me. <laughs> and they caught me off to a detox. And I was there, and I don't ever want to forget, I remember they were taking me down the, uh, the alcoholic section and the nurse, uh, nurse had one arm, and my brother-in-law had, a, had the other arm, and the hair was wild and matted from that two-week growth, that, uh, from that two-week drunk and a two-week growth, and that vomity, dribbly T-shirt, everything I drank and puked was all over the shirt. And uh, these pea-stained pair of with the f- pants with the fly broken, half open, half closed, so I never needed a belt. I just pulled them off, kicked them in the corner, pulled them off, put them on. And naturally, those warm, wrinkled, faithful, farty pair of shorts. I mean, they went with me, they stuck with me from the first drink. I mean, from the beginning of the drunk to the end. If I fell in the street, they fell in the street. If I got locked up for the weekend, they were locked up for the weekend. And mark my words, ladies and gentlemen, one day shorts like those will be holding their own meetings. Believe me. And God knows they deserve them. And I remember they were taking me down, and as you got closer to the nurses' section, what opposite was the men's lounge. And through the corner of my eye, I could see this guy stepping out. And he saw the three of us coming down. He stepped in. I could hear him say, Hey, guys, come out and look at this guy. A real wolf man. Take a look at this guy. And they come out and they went, Oh, and they're all laughing. And they said, Don't touch him, nurse. You get locked, you And they're all laughing. Your fingers are right off one day at a time. And they're all laughing. And I remember this one guy saying, Nah, he's not real. He's an April Fool's Day. They're just trying to scare us. That guy's not real. And they're all laughing. Now, this is the first time in my life, ladies and gentlemen, that a man or a woman ever laughed at me. And I couldn't do anything about it. I remember I was standing there, and this voice, this, vo- this soul-sickening voice that had tortured me all my life, kept digging into me and saying, look at them laughing at you. You've been nothing but a goddamn disgrace all your life. No matter where you sailed, you left the north slick a mile wide. For once in your life, why don't you be a man? For once in your life, try to do something right. Get your head up. Don't let them laugh at you. Get your head up. And I kept trying to get my head up. I remember sucking wind in my, in my lungs, just trying to raise so I could look at these guys in, right in the face. But I just couldn't get my head up. It seems like somebody would use a machete and cut up all my neck muscles and my back muscles. I just couldn't get my head up. And if there's one thing at that moment I wish I could have done, and that was to grab myself by the head of the hair, yank my face up, and spit right into it. That's how I felt about myself. It was the second day over my 38th birthday, and I was physically banked up, mentally banked up, spiritually banked up, financially banked up, and sexually banked up. I see now it's a variety that I've been slipping in and out of impotency since I was about 28 years. And it was tough sex- sexually faking it over the years. I was a sand hog and a seaman and a bartender, and I'd be working the bar, and the guys would be talking about the girls. And this guy here, he took the girl home last night, and he made love two or three times. And the guy over there, he took the girl home. He made love two or three times. And the guy over there, he took the girl home, and he made love two or three times. Well, I see now in sobriety that if these guys are taking these girls home, making love two or three times a night, one thing is for sure, they didn't drink what I was drinking, that's for sure. You don't drink that stuff and go home and make love two or three times. You go home and fall out of the bed two or three times. I know for a fact the closest they're going to get to sex that night is when they pee-pee two or three times. Now, I don't want to believe it is sex thing, but the only reason I bring it up and, and, and throw it out there is because maybe, maybe there's some guy that kind of knows what I'm talking about. As for the women, they know what I'm talking about. And they suggest that 90 days, 90 meetings, I got out five days later, they suggest that 90 days, 90 meetings, get a meeting book, get up front, get a sponsor. And I came out and I had my boy Joe, he was my sponsor, and I sat up front. And right after the meeting, I'd buttonhole one of the old timers, I'd get him on the side. i say, look, I, I want to ask you something. i said, just between you and I. I said, where did you get this idea of 90 days, 90 meetings? Where did you get the concept of 90 days, 90 meetings? And none of the old timers knew. Not only didn't they know, but they couldn't care less. They said, look, Brian, that's no fast, hard AA rule. That just gives yourself a time to get a little the rum out of your brain, you know. But I said, no, nah, no, where did you get 90 days, 90 meetings? It was important to me. 
because I didn't want to make the same mistake twice. I remember when I was a kid in school, I was always being beaten and punished and kept after school over these mystical, esoteric numbers. I remember there was the Twelve Apostles, the Ten Commandments, and the Twelve Lost Tribes of Israel, and the Seven Deadly Sins, and the Eight Wonders of the Ancient World, and the Nine Planets, and the Seven Seas, and the Four Winds. And Moses was on the desert for 40 years, and Columbus was on the Atlantic for 40 days, 40 nights. And now me, 90 days, 90 meetings. But it didn't take me long to figure it out, and I finally came to the conclusion that you have to be here 90 days, 90 meetings, just to understand what the hell they're talking about. Because there's a very sophisticated way of speaking at these meetings. The topic would be, you see, when you made a decision not to make a decision, you made a decision. They go, oh my God, oh my God, what a topic, what a topic. You see, it is in not taking the action that you always take an action. Oh, my God, circuit speaker, circuit speaker. The one that always got me was, you see, you can't keep it unless you give it away. In fact, you have to give it away to keep it. And the more you give, the more you get. And I lean over and I say to Joe, Joe, what the hell are they giving away? They don't work. They're all unemployed, all on welfare. Joe, even some of them are in alimony. Can't you see, Joe? And Joe would say, see what? I said, can't you see? We're being bullshitted, man. We're throwing good money in the basket full of happy horse. He said, my God, are you still in that kick? And he'd get his coffee and he'd move, and I'd see him go there, sit somewhere else. And I'd say to myself, go ahead, run. Run, you stinking AAS kisser. I mean, it seems that that's all they do around here. Stay away from a drink, come to meetings, and run around kissing ass. Well, I said, let me tell you, Joe, kissing ass is in one of my games. It'd be a cold wind blowing through hell today to get a man like me to bend over and kiss ass, I'll tell you that. And I remember, it seems, I, I, I remember looking at the women. I'd turn around, I would look at the women, and God Almighty, it would break my heart looking at the women. I mean, all, all different ages, and it just broke my heart. It seems like their whole life was over that now their whole life revolved around needle pointing. I mean, every now and then I'd hear from the back of the room, I'd hear this big burst of wooing and awing, and I knew they just discovered a new floral pattern. And in my mind's eye, I could see them pearl one, drop two, identify. Pearl one, drop two, and they just pearl and drop and keep going on until the menopause and then on till death. I remember the saying to Joe, Joe, it's not fair. Look at them, Joe, it's not fair. I said, you know, look at them. They, you can just look at them, Joe, and see that they never did anything. And they never will do anything now, Joe. Their sponsors will see to that. <laughs> and it seems like the first 90 days, I kept running into the same cluster of speakers. And it seems like the speakers, they all had a little gimmick that they were selling. And I would sit there and i nickname the speakers, you know, like Easy Does It Stand. One day at a time, Marion. First things first, Glenn. Easy does it, Jane. I had all these nicknames. And he introduced this speaker. And his name was Charlie. And Charlie got up there and he said, I picked up a drink. I fell down a flight of stairs and I surrendered. And I sat there stunned. He picked up a drink, fell down a flight of stairs and surrendered. I mean, I fell off gangways, bar stools, garbage, and never... In a million years would I ever tell a shit story like that in public. I mean, he told that story right in front of the girls. <laughs> I immediately nicknamed him Staircase Charlie. <clears throat> About a week later, they introduced Charlie again. I said, oh, there's Staircase. And I got up and I sat down and I, I, I zeroed in on every word he had to say. Because <clears throat> it was important to me to find out what kind of a staircase it was that made him surrender. Now, maybe he's going to say he picked up a drink and he fell down a four-story spiral staircase. Well, you've got to go along with that, you know. Or maybe he said he picked up a drink and he fell five stories between the banisters. Well, you've got to go along with that one. But there was some the way that Charlie looked and the way he dressed and the way he talked. I knew. I knew in my heart that this guy was strictly a two-step foyer job, you know. And he went into his store and he said, I picked up a drink, I fell on a flight of stairs, and I surrendered. And they all started to applaud and I'll hug him, kiss him, get his autograph, invite him to parties. I sat there saying, 
Why the hell don't he tell the real story? I mean, nobody, but nobody picks up a drink, falls on a flight of stairs and surrenders. The guy had been boozing all day. The guy was drunk. That's why he fell on a flight of stairs. You see, they kept telling me, Brian, keep bringing the body. Keep bringing the body. Sooner or later, the head follows. Here it was, a week later, I'd heard the same story, but this time I heard a little bit different. Now, they introduced him about a week later. Now, this is the third time in a month I'm listening to this guy. I knew his story by heart. And I'm sitting there, and as it got close to picking up that first drink, I felt my stomach tighten up. I said, uh-oh, watch that drink, Charlie. And he got close to it. I said, Charlie, can't you see what you're doing? Watch the drink, Charlie. And Charlie said, and I picked up a drink, and I said, ah, well, grease the banisters. There goes Charlie. I knew in my heart of hearts, ladies and gentlemen, once he picked up that drink, no way in hell could he beat the staircase. I would have laid odds from here to Vegas. I just knew. I just knew for the first time I understood the dynamics of the first drink. I had known all my life it was the first drink, but I never understood it. It was like under, I knew I was an alcoholic, but I never understood it. And I understood that this guy had absolutely nothing going for him. He didn't get a sponsor, never got to meetings, I mean, poopard the whole thing. He had no defense against the first drink. And I saw it, and I understood it. And things started to change. I kept coming to meetings, I got to know people, and I stayed away from the closed meetings and step meetings because of the concept of God. <clears throat> I had walked away from the religion that I was raised in at 14, and nobody, especially you, was about to start ramming God down my throat. But I happened to be at a meeting when I went into the concept of God. And one said it was this, another said it was this, and I remember this young man raising his hand saying, the way he had heard God was G-O-D, good orderly direction. Speaking only for myself, ladies and gentlemen. When I heard that good orderly direction, it seems like my chest split open and centuries of venom and stink brought out. Here now was a God that I could understand, good orderly direction. As far as I was concerned, that's what it was supposed to have been all along. But from where I came from, the way I had heard it, I couldn't buy it. But this I could. And I remember sitting back sort of relaxed and looking at the speaker. And behind the speaker, it had the slogans. And it said, first things first, keep it simple, let go and let God. And the way I read it was, first things first, keep it simple, let go and let good orderly direction. And I literally turned my will and my life over to care of good orderly direction as I understood it, which was you, AA. And the only thing you were asking me, and the only thing I wanted from you, was to stay away from a drink. And the only thing you were asking me was to try to stay away from a drink, Brian. Try to do the best you can. Try to get to a job. Try to get to a meeting. And everything, everything became good orderly direction in my life. I go up to the job, I see the guys fighting on the, in a hog house, all gassed up, getting fired. I walk down the street, I see some guy puking in the street, urinating up against the wall. I walk by a saloon, I see a guy sitting there vacantly staring out, vacantly staring at a light passing him by. I see some young, old, dirty man panhandling on the corner trying to get enough for a drink. And I say to myself, there, but for the grace of good, only direction goes I. And only for myself, ladies and gentlemen, it made all the sense in the world. It made sense to me, because I no longer did any of those things. Because I trusted in you. And the only thing he asked me was to try to stay away from a drink. Try to do the best you can. Try to get to a meeting. And everything became good all the direction. Everything. And I was about a year sober. And I was still working with the dynamite in Van Cortland Park. Working for the midnight. And I'd get up around 11 o'clock in the morning. And I'd usually have breakfast. And right across the street from where I'd have the breakfast, there was a nightclub called Bonnie Google's. And they had a park bench outside of it. And I would sit there with a container of coffee and a cigarette. And I'd get myself together before I got the train and went all the way up to Van Cortland Park. And this particular day, I'm sitting there and having a container of coffee and smoking a cigarette. And up the street comes this little girl with her mother. She looked like a little Shirley Temple. A little ringlets, a little dress and dimpled knees and a big lollipop. And she spotted me. And she come running up and she leaped right up in my lap. And she's there giggling and laughing and she's pushing the lollipop. me. I got the cigarette and the coffee. I'm looking at this kid and the mother come up. The mother said she wants you to lick a lollipop. So I took the lollipop, I put it in my mouth, I rolled my eyes, I made a big fuss about it, the girl was looking at it. I gave it back the lollipop, she pumped it in the mouth, she jumped off, she started skipping up the street. The mother looked at me, I looked at the mother, she nodded, I nodded. They started walking up the street, and as I watched, two of them walk away. All of a sudden, this tremendous feeling of love overcame me. This tremendous feeling. It, 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 it nearly picked me up off, off the bench. And I couldn't quite figure out what it was. And I said, this is good orderly direction. Because everything was good orderly direction since I heard it. I said, this is good orderly direction. And I heard myself say to myself, nah, Brian, this is not good orderly direction. This is the God they've been talking about. This is the God of the rooms. This is the God of sobriety. This is God. 
And I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. I sat there. I mean, God. And here I am with a cup of coffee in one hand, a cigarette in the other, the taste of a child's lollipop, and God. And I was just overwhelmed. And I said, God, God bless you, God. Like I went over his head to his boss or something. I mean, what the... You know, what the what, I'm just waiting to go to work. What the hell do I know, you know? And I was four years sober. I was four years sober when I got a call from San Francisco in 1976 that they were taking a bicentennial ship out of Bad Maine and they were going to crew her up with a East Coast crew. And would I like to be part of the crew? Now, I hadn't sailed since they flew me home from uh, Tokyo that time. And uh, I said, yes, I'd like to go. And they said, all right, go get the shots, the inoculation. We'll be flying the crew up in about two weeks. And uh, about a week, a week before we, uh, the, uh, we were to sail, a friend of mine, Roy, was on a drunk. And Ronnie, his sponsor, and another guy was going to pick him up to take him to a detox. And for what happened, I don't know. By the time they got there, he had opened up the window and dove out 27 stories. So when we got there, it was a mess. The police was there, the fire department there. His wife was there. He had five kids. It was a mess. His, uh, uh, his mother was Jewish and his... Uh, and the father was Catholic, was half Irish and uh, Catholic, and the other half was Jewish. And they, uh, they cremated him, and uh, the mother flew in from San Francisco. And at the memorial service, there was a lot of finger pointings and, and a lot of uh, recriminations. And, uh, and uh, they didn't know what to do with fighting over the ashes. Now, Roy had gone to a sea when he was a kid. And I got together with a sponsor, and we got the mother, and we got the, uh, the wife, and we sat him down. And uh, we explained, I'll be leaving in about a week, and why not give me the ashes, and I'll bury him at sea. And that was about the only thing they agreed to do. And I remember Roy went and got, Ronnie went and got the ashes, and he met me, he gave me the ashes, and about a week later I flew up to uh, Bath, Maine, and the captain had been notified that we'll have a burial at sea. And then we're on our way to Panama, and uh, the captain said, well, you know, Brian, uh, when do you want to have this? I said, well, you know, anytime you want. He said, well, you do have the death certificate, right? I said, no, I don't have a death certificate. He says, well... Uh, if this is an official burial, you need him. When we get to Panama, call his wife up and have her send the necessary papers to San Francisco, and we'll bury him in the Pacific. And I said, all right, which we did. And uh, we, sailed, we sailed for Japan, and uh, the captain, I ran into the captain, he said, when would you like to hold the service? And I said, Captain, if it's at all possible, I would like to bury him on the international date line. And he said, all right, when we get to the international date line, we'll have the service. And it was important to me. It was important to me to have him buried on the international date line because as far as I'm concerned, the one true internationalist is the alcoholic. I mean, we go back to the very beginning, before, before recorded history, ever since the beginning we've been around. I mean, where was all this fermentation? That's how old we are. You know, we go back, first there was the ice man and then the Neanderthal man and all along us, the drunken man. We've been there since the beginning. And that day came, and I remember uh, all the crew came out, and the passengers came out, and, and I can remember it. It was a gorgeous night. God, uh, the sunset that night, uh, I mean, it, it's the kind of sunset that you, that you would want to go down with. It was just beautiful, and the sea was like glass, and all the passengers came out, and they had the plank, the two cadets holding it, and they had the flag. And before I left San Francisco, I bought five uh, long stem roses, red ones, for the uh, five kids and a yellow one for the wife, and I stapled it together in that plastic serenity card prayer we had, so I sort of made a wreath out of it. And the captain had agreed to, uh, to end the service with the Our Father. And I remember they had it, and they dumped it over, and we all said the Our Father, and you could feel the ship picking up speed and the black smoke coming out, and the three toots from the, the ship's whistle saluting a departed seaman. And I remember watching the roses being sucked into the wake, and I walked in to the, to the back of the ship, and there was the, the flowers twisting and turning in the wake. And I was looking at it, and I and looking at the sunset and all that's taking place, and I, I just couldn't believe it. I don't know what went through Roy's head when he was drunk and frightened and he dove out that window. But here he was on the international date line, being buried with dignity. Being buried with AA dignity. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what we bring into each other's lives. We bring dignity. They say the eyes are the windows of the soul. What the newcomer really sees is the hope in our eyes. But what they don't see in that outstretched hand is the dignity. The dignity that we pass to one another. And I went up and I got the longitude and the latitude line. I had photographs taken when I got to Japan. I married it all to the 
I, I, I mailed it to, the, to his wife and the kids. And to this day, to this day, they can go to the map and the longitude, latitude line, and she can turn around and say, this is where my husband was buried, and say it with dignity. And the kids can turn around and say, that's where my father was buried. And in time, in time, the grandchildren can turn around and say, that's where my grandfather was buried. And say it with dignity. Not even know you or I, none of us. But they can say it with dignity. And the ship sailed on. I made meetings all over the world, ladies and gentlemen. And I came back. And the great thing about this program, ladies and gentlemen, is don't ever be afraid to get out there and travel. Don't ever be afraid. Because the great thing about this program is if you get to a country and AA isn't there in that country when you get there, then AA is there when you got there. Because you're AA and I'm AA. And it just takes that matter of, a, of reaching out to the suffering alcoholic. So don't ever be afraid. Get out there and take your shots. And I came back, and with the help of people in the program, in 1982, I graduated from Fordham University with a degree in fine art. I retired from the tunnels in 87. I just retired from another. From another. And uh, I did a lot of things in my life, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of things drunk and a lot of things sober. There's a lot of things I'm proud of and a lot of things I'm ashamed of. And the interesting thing is the one thing that I'm the most proudest of is the one thing that I was the deepest ashamed of. And that was the fact that I couldn't drive a car. I'm not talking about not the ability. I mean, I, I run machinery and that. But whatever it is with a car, I'm talking phobia. I'm talking phobic. I just couldn't. And I was ashamed all those years of not being able to drive a car. And I was uh, sitting at my house one day, and the knock came to the door, and it was a young lady I'd been running around with. And she came in, and she threw a license on the, on the, on the table. And she said, come on, put your shirt on. she said, I'm going to register you in the driving school. I said, oh, let's not get into this now, please. She said, come on, I'm serious. And she literally took me by the hand. We walked about five blocks to a driving academy. And I registered. And every day before I go to work, the guy would be there. And I'd go for a drive all the way in town. And he could always tell me how to drive his lesson. I was like a Michelin man. I'd be like all knocked up, you know, from, from, the, from the stress and the strain. And I went, the day came, and I remember guys would, they, 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 they would take me through the tunnel and over bridges and the, the people in the program. And there's not that many cars in New York, but they'd share it and they'd drive me around and pick me up. And the day came, and I went and I took the test. And a few weeks later, I came home and I opened the mailbox, and there was a letter from the uh, motor vehicles. And I remember sitting down and made myself a cup of tea, and I sat down there and I opened it up, and there was my driver's license. Ladies and gentlemen, believe me, in my wildest fantasy, I never fantasized about driving. I, was, I never fantasized that I was a great racing car driver or I had a big Cadillac and picked up girls. Anything that had to do with a car, it had nothing to do with me. And here I remember sitting there and I, I had a towel and I put the towel in my mouth so the neighbors wouldn't hear me and the tears just ran down my eyes looking at, at this driver's license. And I had it for about six months. And uh, one day... One day, I don't know what it was, I got up, I got showered and shaved, made a cup of tea, I walked up to Avis, and I rented a car. And I pulled the car out of the, 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 the rental place, and it was important to me to find a diner, to drive to a diner. Now, in New York, you don't have diners, you have Greek restaurants and restaurants, but you don't have a diner. And the only one real diner I knew was out in Rockaway. It was around 116th Street. And the, I knew if I went across the bridge and I went on Queens Boulevard, then I turned right at Northern Boulevard, it would take me right into Rockaway. And I remember going over the bridge, and I'm driving the car, and the trucks are coming by, and they're going, move over, you dumb bastard, beep, beep, and I'm holding the car there, and I'm calling, and I made it over, and finally I found the dynamite, and I pulled in the car, and I got out, and I was wringing wet, the, the water was just pouring off me, pouring out of my shoes, there was about three steps to get up, I had a hard time getting up the steps to get into the diner, because my pants were soaking wet and stuck to my ass, and I was pulling that right, you know. And I got out, and I remember I walked in, and I sat on a stool, and I ordered a cup of coffee. And ladies and gentlemen, to this day, that was the greatest moment of my life. That was the peak moment of my life, sitting there, drinking that. I mean, they say everybody has 15 minutes of fame. Well, I had three cups of coffee of it. Let me tell you, I was never so proud of myself as I was sitting at that. And I got up. And I got in the car, and I was back in the car, right? and you know how that voice, that voice is still there with me, and the voice is digging into me saying, look at him back in that car, right? look at him looking over his shoulder, look at him turning that wheel with one hand, what a man, what a man. 
And I got back, ladies and gentlemen, and I paid Avis, and I walked out, and that was the last time I drove a car. <laughs> the hell with that, man. The hell with that. I got my boy Cadillac Joe Puglisi in New York. He's the best AA wheel man in, in New York. And, man, he gets me to where I have to go. And thank God for Marilyn. She got me here safe and sound and stand. And Miami, and more than likely, they'll get me back to the airport tomorrow. And, uh, but I have, I have the license. I mean, New York says I'm one of their best in case uh, I have to pull out a car. But I just I don't bother with it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here I am now. I'm retired. I'm a college graduate. I got a college degree. I got a driver's license. And I wish I could stand here tonight and tell you I finally know what I want to be when I grow up. I wish I could tell you here I am fully potentiating. I'm really hitting the mark. But the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, I still don't know. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. In fact, I still don't even know who I am. And I found out in these rooms that it's really not that important to know who you are. What is important is to recognize what you are not. I'm not that young man the FBI took off from Mobile, Alabama in handcuffs and stood trial for near beating a man to death. I'm not that man the FBI took off in New York in handcuffs and stood trial on charges of mutiny. I'm not that man dragging a woman out of, a, uh, out of the cab by the hair of the head, dragging her back into a bar because I hadn't finished drinking yet. I'm not that man sitting there vacantly staring out, vacantly staring out at life or that old young dirty man on the corner be, hustling some change trying to get into the bar. Thank God I'm not that dirty stink that was taken into that detox. Thanks to you, ladies and gentlemen, I am not a lot of things today. I am not a lot of things thanks to you and this magnificent program. And somehow, by seeing the many things that I am not, somehow I begin to see the many things that I am. And on those rare occasions when I do have the courage and wisdom to take a long, hard look, I see the many things I can yet become if I continue to adhere to the simple program, if I continue staying away from a drink, if I continue practicing these pimples in all my affairs. I was in San Francisco, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you a gift that was passed on to me. I'm going to give you a spiritual experience. When I'm finished telling you what this lady said, you'll feel a rush of gratitude hit. You'll feel air pump right out of your mouth. This is what the theme of this is, this electric, uh, uh, of uh, this uh, spiritual experience. I was in San Francisco in 1976 when I was on that bicentennial ship, and it was Christmas. And I was looking for a meeting. And it was out by the mission there somewhere. And it was a dingy storefront that had like little candles and little bells and... And I heard a statement made by a lady in its spiritual simplicity. It took all of Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson and the steps and traditions and promises and conferences, you and me, and reduced everything, everything to its lowest denominator. Listen to what she said. She said, by no means has AA opened the gates of heaven and let me in, but they sure opened the gates of hell and let me out. You feel that kick? That's what we're all about, ladies and gentlemen. We're just simply alcoholics trying to hold that gate one more day to let one more of us out. Of course, we're not our brother's keepers, but we are the gatekeepers, and for that we are responsible. Ladies and gentlemen, on my bended knee, I thank the Almighty God for each and every one of you. And on my other knee, I thank each and every one of you for me. Thank you for me, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.